Hello and welcome to Surgery Secrets, where we go behind the scenes to uncover secrets about surgery you won't hear in the classroom. My name is Isabel, and today we are sitting down with Dr. Peters. Let's get started. So we'll begin with some quick fire kind of short answer questions. Um, so they'll be easy, don't worry. Um, can you tell us your name? Yeah, my full name is Blair Robert Peters. And what is your occupation? So I am a plastic and reconstructive surgeon um, with a subspecialty um, training in gender affirming surgery, which is the bulk of my practice. And I do some niche peripheral nerve surgery as well. And where do you work? I'm currently in Portland, Oregon at Oregon Health Science University, OHSU for short. And you answer this a little bit already, but what does your job entail? Yeah, so the bulk of my practice is gender affirming surgery, um, which is full breadth. So I do facial surgery, chest surgery, body contouring, and genital gender affirming surgery. So typically that would mean phalloplasty and vaginoplasty. Um, and then I do peripheral nerve surgery. So a lot of nerve transfers. Um, so operating on people with um, peripheral nerve trauma, brachial plexus injuries, or spinal cord injury, trying to reanimate extremities. And what is your favorite color? I guess pink, because it's the color of my hair right now. So easy answer. <laughs> um, what's your favorite food? Um, right now, I'd say very specifically Killer Burger in Portland. They have this like amazing hot and spicy peanut butter burger, which sounds grotesque, but it's the bomb. So, <laughs> Well, if I'm ever there, I'll check it out. <laughs> yes, you should. You should. Um, what is your favorite superhero? I think the flash very underrated. Um, I feel like the flash is good enough respect. So if I could be someone, I'd probably be the flash if we're talking superpowers. What is your favorite musical artist? I think honestly, Ariana Grande, love her. Listen to her operating all the time. Your favorite movie. Mm, I think of the moment I would say disclosure. I watch a lot of documentaries, so I think that was probably the most powerful one I've watched recently. If you haven't watched it, everyone should. It's basically about um, how the media portrays transgender people and the effect that that's had on all of us, so check it out. It's on Netflix. Awesome. We will have to do that. Um, your favorite organ of the body? I'll just say the genitalia because genital surgery is probably my passion, so um, just genitalia in general last book you read? The last book I read was actually um, by Susan Stryker called Transgender History. And can you recommend me a TV show? I would recommend Sense8. Okay. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't, but I'll have to look at it. <laughs> it's amazing. It's honestly, you got to give it like three or four episodes but once you get past that critical threshold it will blow your mind and it's like one of the best shows that's really done representation from like a racial gender identity and sexual orientation standpoint the best I will also have to check that out so many great recommendations <laughs> <laughs> so awesome you passed the quick fire round so we're gonna move on to our nitty-gritty questions um, so can you tell me who your biggest influence was whether that be personal or career-wise Hmm. I think it's honestly hard to pick one particular person because I think it's important to have more than like one main mentor or sponsor throughout your life and your career. Um, so I've definitely had many, but for sure one that comes to mind recently in the last couple of years is uh, my main mentor from my last fellowship, um, which was at Washington University in St. Louis, where I did my peripheral nerve and microsurgery training. Um, and that's with Susan McKinnon, who She's like a huge juggernaut pioneer of plastic surgery. Um, one of the first women plastic surgeons, one of the first women to ever be a head of a society, basically trailblazed the entire field of peripheral nerve surgery, massively accomplished. Um, and, you know, training with her surgically was amazing, but I think she is the person that impacted me the most in terms of my just like approach to life and overall patient care and work-life balance. Um, and really sort of taught me to have this attitude and like culture of gratitude and taking care of yourself before taking care of other people. Um, and just really, 
I think is authentically herself in a space that like never really welcomed her. She's seven years old now. So you can imagine what it was like being a female surgeon four years ago. Um, and as a queer person, I think I relate to her a lot in that way, sort of carving out your own space and unapologetically being yourself in what is sometimes a very cisgender, heterosexual, white male dominated space um, and how to take up that space unapologetically. So I would say Susan McKinnon, she's a legend. <laughs> She sounds like it. Um, I guess I can only imagine how hectic and busy school was for you. Do you have a memorable moment in your training? Oh, Lord. Um, what a broad question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so many. It's, it's funny. I think even just going through residency training, like I trained at the University of Manitoba, which, um, so I'm Canadian trained. I think, are you guys Canadian? Yeah, we're, yeah. we're based out of Edmonton, Alberta. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So I trained in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, and it's been interesting crossing over to the United States because our catchment areas in Canada are so much larger. So just the volume of patients that you're seeing is just so much higher than what a lot of American training and exposure is. Um, and I feel like the amount of like, you know, honestly, like career changing, life changing experiences or patient interactions are too many and too numerous to count that I often forget about a lot of them unless someone says something particular that like sparks that memory. Um, so it's hard for me to pick any one story, but. Sure, if, if that's way too broad for you, which I know is a very broad question, do you have a recent memorable moment? Yeah, I can, I can definitely tell you one. I think, um, so I've just finished my fellowship in gender affirming surgery, um, like within the last few weeks. Um, and I've spent kind of the last, honestly, like four or five days a week in the operating room. And um, with that makeup, haven't spent a ton of time getting to see my post-ops. Um, and just our physician assistant was away and someone needed to cover and do some of our initial um, dressing takedowns on some of our vaginoplasty and vulvoplasty patients. And a big part of my practice going forward is I spend a day a week doing um, vaginoplasty. Um, and, you know, I kind of went in, took down my first dressing and, you know, for you, sometimes it's just like, oh, it's a dressing takedown. It's not that big of a deal, but, you know, the patient just stopped me and just sort of said, you know, like you saved my life. And like, you know, you're just Tuesday, 7 a.m. Um, and it's such a profoundly impactful thing. I think it just sort of stopped me for a moment to be like, wow, like what a privilege I get to come to work nine to five someday. Well, not nine to five, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> but, you know, I get to like electively come to work and do this really amazing thing and do elective surgery and, you know, objectively in some ways save people's lives with plastic surgery. Um, and what a privilege that is, especially being a queer person from the community. Um, but it's interesting, even being a queer person from the community, how easy it is to lose sight sometimes of how impactful it is what you're doing, because there's like this line you have to walk as a surgeon where you need to be like your own person and not lose sight of how important and sometimes how dangerous what you're doing is, but also not take on that stress to the level that it interferes with you doing your job and your own humanity. So it's such a hard line to tiptoe sometimes. And I think we don't necessarily walk it straight. We kind of curve on either side of it. And you have moments like that that put you back where you need to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that was an impactful experience for me. Mm -hmm. You almost need to pinch yourself sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Or smack yourself back to reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So because you do something quite niche in surgery, I'm assuming, is there mm -hmm. some things that people don't understand about your job? Oh gosh, so many things. Um, gender affirming surgery is an interesting field in the way that a lot of these procedures or iterations of them have been done for decades, but in many ways kind of behind closed doors um, and very much outside of academic medicine. Um, often in Thailand or Europe, or maybe a couple of private clinics in the United States, but certainly not anything that you were exposed to during medical training. Um, and because of that, academic medicine and surgery knows very little about, you know, LGBTQ plus and gender affirming care. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation, both in the public and even within the community. And a big part of that is when you have this whole area of medicine basically being practiced outside of, of, of academics, there hasn't been very much formal research or formal writing or formal teachings in that area. So it's created this 
sort of interesting paradigm where some of the procedures have been around for a long time, but there's just very little out there about them, especially that's accurate. So I feel like half of my day to day is just taking down misinformation, whether that's, you know, with other healthcare providers or online or with people in my own life, or sometimes patients that have been sort of fed, you know, false narratives as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can see how that might become tiring after a while to, to try and try and kind of I guess, right the wrongs or, or bring up the misinformation that, that's happened beforehand. Um, so I guess kind of on the other end of that, what would you say is the absolute best part of your job? Oh, gosh, I think just like, it kind of relates to, I think, like you said, sometimes taking, taking on these false narratives. I remember going through training and especially later in my residency years when I decided I was ultimately going to spend the bulk of my time doing gender affirming care, there's this misconception, um, especially amongst surgeons that transgender patients are very high maintenance. And it's, you know, this really difficult patient population with all these mental health comorbidities. And, you know, like, I was like brave and like such a good person for going into that field. And honestly, that couldn't be further from the truth. Like, yes, mental health outcomes are super important. And perioperative mental health support is very, very critical to the success of these surgeries. But you literally will not meet a more like dedicated focus group of patients that will follow every single post-op instruction they have that truly, I feel like are entering a partnership with you and are more appreciative than any other patient I've experienced through any other surgical rotation or any other surgery I've done. So I think just the connection you get to form with your patients and especially people that, you know, I frequent the same community spaces with, like I literally get to treat and improve the quality of life of my community members. And as much as I think I affirm them in terms of, you know, assisting with their surgical transition, they affirm me as like a provider and a person and that, you know, I'm doing something meaningful and useful with my time and energy. Mm -hmm. Wow, that must be really special just to just to see those patients every day. Um, yeah, it's, it's to anyone that hasn't seen like a preoperative and postoperative person going through gender affirming surgery, even something as standard as chest surgery, you see one person on the other side of that and you'll forever support gender affirming surgery 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we heard what the best part of your job is. Now, can you tell us what the worst part of your job is? Yeah, I think, I think the hard part that I struggle with is Western medicine as a whole, you know, in many ways, for sure historically and still presently really oppresses queer people. And, you know, you're trying to do gender affirming surgery oftentimes in a system that is not designed to gender affirming surgery. And it's hard sometimes bringing patients into academic medical environments and feeling very protective of them, but not being able to protect them from every other person that they're going to encounter along that journey. And, I think for me, the most difficult part was training in Canada and being used to a public healthcare system where I can operate on anyone that needs surgery versus coming to the United States and having to deal with insurance and a lot of patients not having insurance and not being able to access care. Um, and the real struggle I find with my practice and especially in the United States is some of the patients that need my services the most and have the most amounts of dysphoria and oftentimes the worst sort of accompanying mental health disorders. They're often the patients that you can't find stable housing for and you can't get a safe post-operative care plan for. And it's a really, really big struggle, especially when insurance comes into play to get them on the operating table. Um, so I find that really difficult where so much of it is out of your control. And it's an interesting thing as a surgeon to almost have surgery be like the afterthought or the thing that you're not worried about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of that, how it's not just surgery you're in charge of, it's the post-operative care of the patient as well. So that's a whole other kind of ball game that you have to think about. Yeah, I mean, you can operate on someone if it's gonna be dangerous afterwards. So it's, um, it's a struggle sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess kind of going away again from, from kind of, um, the worst part of your job, uh, something a bit more silly. Um, can you tell us the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you at work? Ooh, 
the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me at work. Um, well, I feel like embarrassment takes a lot of different forms. I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to sort of bring up embarrassment in the form of discrimination. So I've spent a lot of time, especially like coming off the tail end of June, which was Pride Month, I did a lot of sort of speaking and um, I do a lot of ad advocacy and activism work. And one of the things that had been bothering me lately in a lot of lectures I was giving was this like ongoing topic of professionalism. And it just kind of clicked for me one day, like how many instances in my own training in medical school or residency, like how many times that word or concept was weaponized against me. Um, and it led me to write this piece called Professionalism is a, Professionalism is a Trojan Horse. And a big group of us from like med Twitter and stuff got together and recorded a podcast episode talking about this. And I think anyone that's minoritized in any way, like whether you are a woman or a sectional minority or a person of color understands what I'm talking about. Um, and I think for me, that was the thing that stood out was the homophobia and like the things that were said to me under the guise of professionalism, whether it was commenting on like having a visible tattoo or having pink hair or wearing really tight and short pants or whatever silly thing it quote unquote was like professionalism was used to embarrass me into like shaming me into assimilating to what the image of like a white cisgender heterosexual surgeon is supposed to look like. Um, and I have many stories that all sort of have that similar concept. So I choose to use my embarrassment to put it back onto the people that embarrassed me. That's a good tool. <laughs> we'll definitely have to kind of share that podcast that you did then. Um, we'll definitely be looking for it. It's called um, The Battle Cry. It's um, by my friend, Dr. Maria Yuloku. Um, and yeah, just put in The Battle Cry and it's the episode on professionalism. Check it out. Awesome. Okay, yeah, we'll definitely share that. Um, can you tell us a bit about your support system and what they mean to you? Yeah, um, mine is definitely very robust, which I have this conversation with a lot of students that I mentor, they're especially queer students that are talking about or wanting to go into surgery. Um, I don't think anything's more important than the support system that you have. And if you don't have a strong support system, identifying how to improve upon that. Um, because, you know, the reality is the surgery training is hard. Um, and I think it's probably always going to be in some way, shape or form. And as much as you can try to control, you know, choosing the right program and the right place to be more than anything, what's going to really protect you is the people at home. So my support system is, um, I live with my partner, his name's Jamal. Um, he is an operations manager of a bunch of pharmacies out here. We have a cat. I don't really know if she's supportive, but <laughs> she's here. <laughs> and then most of my friends and family are in Canada. Um, so I have my parents and then I have a twin sister, um, Nicole and my brother-in-law Drew. And then I have a nephew named Owen and, and just like a lot of really amazing friends. Um, my two best friends are OBGYNs, total baddies. So whoever says that Obsganis aren't surgeons, you are <laughs> totally wrong and no, don't listen to anyone because they are the hardest working people I know and they do the craziest things. So OBGYNs are surgeons and internists and probably better than any of you. So that's that. <laughs> so my support system is really cool. Um, I think it is important to have people outside of medicine though, just to sort of pull you back to reality from time to time. So keep your non-medical friends. Easier said than done, but do try to keep them. <laughs> So when you first started school, did you ever imagine yourself living your current life? No, not at all. Um, are you talking about medical school or just university? Even, even university, medical school, wherever you'd like to start. I mean, what, what, whatever, whatever school it is, I, no, for sure not. <laughs> um, I, I definitely had a lot of sort of change of plans along the way. Um, no, I definitely always planned to be in Canada. So being in the U.S. is, I never thought would happen for sure. Um, didn't ever see myself being a gender affirming surgeon, especially not at like this level and caliber. Didn't necessarily see myself as like, a, you know, researcher, sort of big academic 
up and coming person, certainly not having a social media presence. So it's, it's interesting to see where I'm at now. Yeah, but for sure wasn't really in the cards up front. Um, so if you weren't doing your current job, what do you think you would be doing? What career would you most like to do? Yeah, um, well, back in my undergrad days, I never actually planned to go to university at all. Um, I was an elite triathlete all throughout high school um, and was on the national triathlon team in Canada. And basically my parents kind of like made me a deal that, you know, they'd only support me kind of training if I registered for a couple of university classes. So I begrudgingly did. And then actually sort of realized there was a whole like long backstory to this, but ultimately I realized I didn't actually like elite sports that much and I was just good at them so therefore I felt like that's what I had to do and spend my time doing and eventually sort of had this wake-up call and was like oh I actually don't like this um and then ended up kind of curving and going the medical route so I think if I didn't have that epiphany and a certain couple key events in my life happen I probably would have kept going down that road and I don't know how far I would have gone <laughs> with it because I see a lot of my friends that are still in triathlon in their early thirties. And, you know, I was 17, 18, I'm talking about at this point. So that's kind of a little scary to think about. And I'm very happy that that's not me as much as I support them. That is definitely not what I loved. Mm -hmm. I think if I could pick anything, it's hard to say, but I definitely have a lot of creativity. I'm usually good for a one-liner. So I feel like I would have been good at like making jingles or doing something kind of like niche in marketing. That would be fun. That would be really fun. <laughs> um, so I guess kind of on to our last question here. If you could go back, what advice would you give your younger self or someone considering your career? Ooh. Um, I think I'll start with the, the career part of that question. Um, because I do feel like I've had this conversation a lot recently, actually, with a bunch of med students from both Canada and the US. Um, and it always takes sort of the similar theme of being able to sort of be your authentic self as someone with very little power who's very junior in a system that is traditionally like very regimented with a lot of hierarchy. And I'm asked the question a lot about oh, like you're this like really strong, unapologetic queer voice in medicine and you have pink hair and you're a surgeon and all these things. And that's great, but it's not like I started like that as a medical student. Um, and, you know, you need to feel it out. And I talk a lot about this like concept of a glass wall and we're all very familiar with the glass ceiling, which is, you know, this sort of invisible barrier that often limits the marginalized groups sort of advancement, often referring to careers of women. And I talk about the glass wall in the context of like being a queer person in the medical field where you constantly feel like you're about to out yourself or sensing how out can I be? How safe am I in this environment? Um, and it takes a lot of mental energy to navigate those experiences. Um, and I really struggled, I think my first few years, like trying to be my authentic self, but also fit into a system and not feel like I was putting myself back in the closet and assimilating in order to like, you know, be desirable by residency programs. And it definitely caused me a lot of mental turmoil. And I think I talked to a lot of students that I mentor about those, you know, okay, what does professionalism look like for you? So I think I wish I realized a little bit sooner in my training, especially in medical school, but really my first couple of years of residency, um, if you, are true to yourself and you work hard and you are reliable, people will respect you and you will find your niche and where you need to be. So don't waste time and mental energy like trying to change yourself or assimilate to a system that you think you need to assimilate to because we need different perspectives and we need unique voices, especially in surgery and a lot of these sort of traditionally white male dominated fields. Um, and that's easier for me to say, cause you know, I'm like an attending and I have a staff job now and I get that. Um, but it does get better and it's important to sort of keep your mental health and your sense of self intact as you go through that training process and it takes active effort. So I wish I had realized that a little bit sooner 
because I feel like the last year especially have like really really seized my power and have seen what doors that's blowing open for me and I wonder what I would have been like you know five years ago if I'd stepped into it sooner well that is some great advice so <laughs> thank you so much Dr. Peters for joining us today on Surgery Secrets it was a pleasure having you having you join our series. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was fun. And there you have it. Join us next time for another exclusive look into surgery today. Follow us on LinkedIn for new Surgery Secrets episodes and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For more information on Surgery 101, head to our website, surgery101.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.